Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In this second section of my paper on the crisis in Islamic economics, I will add some material that I have developed since I wrote the paper. Before we can explain the crisis in Islamic economics, we have to consider the question of what is Islamic economics. And it turns out the answer to this is very complicated. To understand why it is difficult to define Islamic economics, we have to consider two puzzles. First of all, the subject came into prominence in 20th century. Uh, so the question is, why did it become important in 20th century? Why wasn't this subject treated by earlier authors? And the second question is that if there is something which became a subject, a discipline in 20th century, how can it be Islamic? Any Islamic subject should be traced back to the original teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. So these two are related puzzles. To answer these puzzles, we must first step back and consider what is Western economics. So here we will characterize very briefly a very long and complex story. In Christianity, love of wealth is the root of all evil, but uh, capitalism has been characterized as the pursuit of wealth for its own sake. So in order to get to capitalism, there had to be a transition. Uh, and in fact, uh, what happened was that there was continuous warfare between Protestants and Catholics, which led to eventually the peace of Westphalia and the rejection of religion as the basis for uh, society. And eventually this led to loss of faith among the Europeans, the denial of God in Judgment Day. And after that, it becomes natural to pursue wealth and luxury in this world because that's all you have. And so basically then the goal of life becomes to maximize pleasure and the social purpose can be thought of as providing the maximum amount of pleasure to the maximum amount of people. So all of this is the result. All of this is modern economics and it is the result of the rejection of religion. In replacing Christianity, economics became the new religion of Europeans initially and the Western civilization. And later on, this religion has spread to all of mankind. Before the emergence of economics, uh, economics was always subordinate to politics and to society and was always considered together with these subjects. But um, uh, Karl Marx argued that actually it's the economic structures of society, the structures of production and consumption that determine the social and political structures. So he put economics at the center of things. And similarly, capitalists argued that economics can be considered separately from politics and society. So in both cases, economics emerged as an independent discipline, which was central to uh, European and Western societies. When pursuit of wealth became the religion of the Europeans, this led them to the global conquest and colonization of the world because they had no moral compunctions. They said that all is fair in love and war, which means that uh, there is no ethics involved when you go out to conquer the world. And because of their conquest of the world, their ideas also spread to all of the world. So the process of global conquest and colonization led to the conquest of about 90% of the globe coming under the domination of Europe in the early 20th century. After this, the European World War I and the European World War II uh, sapped the strength of the European colonizers. And this enabled libera liberation movements to succeed all over the globe. And Muslim lands became free. But uh, remember that freedom struggles always require an ideology. You're asking people to put their lives on the line to risk their lives. So there has to be a dream. And the dream, one aspect of the dream was the Islamic state, which would have new economic, political, and social structures, which would be much superior to those of capitalism and communism. So the founders of Islamic economics, um, Maududi, Bakr Sadr, and many others, set out the economic basis for an Islamic state and said that this would be far superior 
to the capitalist and the communist economies. Freedom from the West did not lead to expected results. After the end of colonizations, the liberated Islamic nations continued to have the same institutional structures, the same Western political, social, economic structures as before, um, before freedom. So Islamic leadership uh, turned to political Islam in order to achieve revolution within these Islamic countries to bring about uh, the rule of uh, Sharia, uh, Islamic law. Uh, these efforts also failed and so uh, the way of thinking and the strategy for Islamic economics was drastically revised and the turning point can be dated to the first international conference on Islamics in economics in 1976 which uh, started led to the second generation of Islamic economics. The second generation said that since revolution is impossible, let us achieve our economic goals by evolution. Let's start with the capitalist economics and modify it slowly and gradually to achieve uh, Islamic economics. In this process of evolution, uh, the a uh, lot of uh, fundamental assumptions of modern economics were accepted and taken for granted. So whereas the first generation wanted to create a revolutionary alternative to Western economics, the second generation said, let us uh, take most of uh, Western economics for granted and uh, create uh, Islamic economics as a branch of Western economics. So there is a dramatic difference between first and second generation on some of the key concepts. The first generation denied the concept of scarcity. They did not accept utility maximization. And they said, no, competition, we have cooperation in Islamic societies. But the second generation accepted all of these fundamental assumptions of modern Western economics. The paper we're discussing is called the crisis of Islamic economics, which should really be called the crisis of second generation Islamic economics. Second generation abandoned the revolutionary goals of the first generation and they wanted to mix Islamic economics with capitalist economics. This is like trying to mix fire and uh, ice. Um, and uh, this mixture did not produce any satisfactory results because you can't mix them. The discipline itself for the past, uh, to, uh, since 1976 has been trying to explain what is Islamic economics with no answers. There are at least 30 different definitions of Islamic economics. There are no textbooks around which explain what Islamic economics is. A uh, couple of textbooks published last year are so similar to Western texts that it's hard to understand what is the distinguishing feature of Islamic economics. The global financial crisis of 2007 demonstrated the failure of conventional economics. Uh, Islamic economics, which had tied its boats to the uh, conventional economics, it also has collapsed and it has uh, been a theoretical and empirical fa failure because they have adopted the ideas of modern economics which says that everyone should take their own desire for their God and maximize their pleasure. This failure has been widely realized by many authors. For example, Najatullah Siddiqui, one of the uh, leading Islamic economists has said that the there was a grand idea of providing an alternative to capitalism and socialism, and now we have just want to join the flock, join the crowd of modern economists as one branch of this. Uh, similarly, about the practical implications, we have failed to provide a model. So the revolution in Iran and in Afghanistan, they did not have any alternatives to capitalism to say that this is our system which is different from the capitalism. Uh, so it's uh, apparent that Islamic economics does not have any alternatives which provide for the grand claims made earlier that we will provide justice and equity and uh, relieve poverty, etc. Uh, there was no such system in sight uh, and there is nothing like that available in the models of Islamic economics currently available from the second generation. While the second generation was busy trying to build Islamic economics as a minor modification of Western economics. Just add zakat and replace interest and see what happens. There were many revolutions launched in economics, behavioral economics, happiness economics, agent-based models, donut economics, zero growth models. 
uh, all of these can be thought of as implementations of some of the radical insights of Islam. So in, the, in a sense, all of these revolutions are lost opportunities which we could have implemented if uh, we had followed the insights of the first generation. But by abandoning the idea of revolution and uh, thinking of Islamic economics as a branch of Western economics, we lost all of these chances. But the golden opportunity still exists for us because all of these attempts to modify Western economics are just partial and incoherent, whereas Islam offers a, a grand and coherent alternative vision of a society based on cooperation, generosity, and social responsibility, which currently does not exist neither within the conventional economics framework nor within the unorthodox or heterodox alternatives which have been developed. So there is today a golden opportunity for us to revive the vision of the first generation and to create a revolutionary alternative to conventional economics.